Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast with Rebecca Coombs, the place where you can learn how to achieve a happy, healthy gut. Here's what's coming up on today's show. Welcome to episode 52 of the Healthy Gut Podcast. Today we're joined by Sharon Treadgold, who has been on a gut healing adventure since the summer of 2016 when she first tested positive for SIBO. And today we are doing a real life story of somebody that has lived and breathed SIBO firsthand. She's been guided by the mantra, this sucks, but I can handle it and has found unexpected strength through her suffering. With chronic digestive disorders on the rise, she believes the time is ripe for a gut health revolution. She's not exactly sure what that will look like, but she's certain there will be plenty of Swiss chard, deep breathing, dance parties and belly laughs involved. An elementary school teacher and a self-proclaimed gut activist, she hopes to see organic food served in school cafeterias by the time she retires. Sharon is an absolute hoot. I just enjoy talking to her so much. She's one of my SIBO coaching program clients and I've had the absolute pleasure of working with Sharon for the past seven months. She joined the program the day it launched. We talk about her story and really get into how she ended up where she is today because I think it's so important for us to share the real life stories behind the face of SIBO. She's very candid with sharing her experience with treating her SIBO, the types of treatments that she's tried, what's worked and what hasn't worked. And we go through the five key pillars to health, which are awareness, nutrition, movement, mindset and lifestyle. And we cover what's worked for her and whether there is anything that hasn't worked for her. And the importance for Sharon of building a dream team of healthcare professionals who have been able to take her on this journey and get her to where she is today. Plus, she shares her tips and tricks for living and dealing with SIBO. So I hope you enjoy today's episode with Sharon Treadgold. I am thrilled to welcome Sharon Treadgold onto the Healthy Gut Podcast today. It's so wonderful to have you on the show. Hi, Rebecca. It's really exciting to be talking to you. And what, you know, it really is a great, it's a great story um, that we're going to share today. And that is your personal health story and your journey with SIBO and other conditions. But why I'm so excited to have you on the show today is just that, you know, where you have come from and where you are today with your health is really um, so inspiring for other people uh, who are perhaps earlier in their journey and might be feeling really miserable and sick. And, you know, I just, every time I I, um, you see you, you put a post in our um, SIBO coaching program group. Uh, it just makes me filled with joy because um, I'm so proud of where you have come. So, you know, And for, for my listeners, Sharon is part of my SIBO coaching program. And we first um, you know, sat down over our um, internet connection and had a chat with each other probably about five months ago now and uh, and you know it's really great to have been a part of your healthcare team um, over these past five months and um, being able to support you on your journey so I'd, I'd love for you to share with the listeners a little bit about you and your own experience with SIBO. Yes I'd be happy to and uh, I'm going to start with the day my poop changed, changed, and that was March fourth, twenty sixteen. I had uh, um, just had a lot of coffee, and I went to the bathroom. And oh my goodness, I know it's the Healthy Gut Podcast, so I can say things about poop that I normally wouldn't. Say. <laughs> you can. <laughs> and they they were there there in the toilet. These weird floating gray snaky poops. And they just wouldn't stop. And I thought, okay, something is wrong. And so after a couple of weeks, I ended up at the Kaiser Permanente. It's our healthcare, um, big kind of corporation healthcare that we've got here in the States. And I have it through my job. And I said to the woman who was my um, 
like urgent care doctor, I said, I'm going to Hawaii tomorrow and I can't be having weird poop. <laughs> and she ex did the exam and she gave me this FODMAP diet. She said, you've got IBS, follow this FODMAP diet. And I thought, oh, well, okay. And I took one look at that diet and it was so confusing and I couldn't understand how I could have blueberries but not blackberries and how I wasn't supposed to have so many artichokes, if any, but I could have lettuce. It just seemed so strange. And I thought, well, to heck with it. I'm going to Hawaii and, and have a good time. And I had a pretty good time in Hawaii because I think I was relaxed. I was eating a lot of um, fresh foods. And when I got home, I thought, okay, I'm going to try this FODMAP thing. Well, on the FODMAP diet, you could have some uh, gluten-free items. And of course, as the carb lover that I am, I went a little too crazy on these gluten-free rice crackers. And I thought, well, this FODMAP thing isn't working because these are gluten-free and what's wrong? So I thought, I know, I'll take the healthy approach. And I got pasta that was made uh, with, with beans. I put on tomato sauce. I had my hummus, my tofu, tons of smoothies, beets, cottage cheese, all these things that I know now were just making it worse. And I became so bloated and frustrated. And this went on and on. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to let this go and go off, it was summertime, and go to Denmark and visit my nephew. And my message from Denmark is it's a lot more fun to have diarrhea in Denmark than it is to have it in Portland. <laughs> but either way, it's no fun. So when I got back to Portland, I thought, okay, this is just not working. So um, I ended up at my Kaiser doctor and I said, I've got diarrhea now. Remember, I used to be constipated. And her line always was with the constipation, just relax and tell yourself to go. And I said, I, I try that. It's just not working. And this time with diarrhea, she said, you need to diversify. And I thought, I'm trying to diversify, and that wasn't working. So I learned from reading about FODMAP that it was only a temporary solution and you couldn't be on FODMAP forever. And I thought, this FODMAP thing isn't working. I don't think it's low enough. So I asked Kaiser for a nutritionist and she heard my story and she said to me, I think you need to get out of Kaiser and go to the naturopathic college and get something called a breath test because I think you have SIBO. And I said, Oh my gosh, just a couple weeks ago, I was at a party talking with a friend and he was telling me that he had been to India because he had had so many gut problems and he had this thing called SIBO. And I said, oh, I think I've seen that on the internet. And he said, yeah, if you've got IBS, you probably have. And he told me just terrible things that he had tried and endured and all I could think of was, oh my goodness, thank goodness I don't have that. IBS is nothing compared to this SIBO business. So I ended up at the naturopathic college and I had a breath test on August 10th. And the breath test, they didn't give at the college anymore. My friend who had gone to India said that he had gotten his there at the college. But when I called them, they said, we don't offer that. You can do it yourself or you can go to this place called Eight Hearts. And all I could think of after doing the research on the breath test was, I can't do this myself, it's too stressful. And so I ended up at Eight Hearts, and three days after the breath test, I went back to the college, and my naturopath there at the time, Dr. Cox, a really wonderful woman, said, yes, you have SIBO. And I said, well, the amazing thing is, the prep diet that I did for it stopped my diarrhea. That's what made me not have diarrhea 24-7, was just eating chicken. And she said, yep, you're going to probably have to start this uh, SIBO-specific food guide, and we'll start you on an herbal protocol. So 
So things were going um, pretty well that first month. And then I heard she was going to maybe leave. And I thought, oh, no, I can't be without Dr. Cox. And so I thought, where can I go? And I remembered eight hearts. I called them up and I said, I need to see the SIBO King. SSL, because by that time I'd read enough about Steven Sandberg Lewis, and I know he was the king of SIBO. And they said, well, if you want to see the king, you're going to have to wait three months. And I thought, I can't wait three months um, because I'm in transition between another doctor. And they said, well, you can see the owner of the clinic, Dr. Jason Wysocki. And I thought to myself, well, if you can't see the king, at least you can see the prince. So I said to Dr. Cox, I hear you might be leaving. I'm off to see the prince. She said, I'm actually staying. I'm not leaving. But she said, from everything that we've experienced this last month, I think you really do need to go to Eight Hearts. And that's when I thought, "Uh uh-oh, I'm going to be one of those tough cases. So I started at Eight Hearts, and SIBO Prince, Dr. Jason Wysocki, listened to me that first day for nearly two hours. It was amazing. He switched up some of the protocol and um, I was ready to go. And then within a few days, everything just crashed. I thought I was really literally going to die. It was a combination of die off. I was short of breath. I felt freezing. I was exhausted. I was thirsty. My eyes were dry. I just had every pain imaginable. I felt like I had the flu. My hands were numb. I just, I didn't know what to do. And I called, I emailed him and the poor guy, he responded to my email. I set up a phone conversation with him and I said, I just feel like I can't even work. So after a few days, I um, calmed down a bit and went to Kaiser because I was continuing to feel awful. And he said, maybe you better just go in and get checked out. And so they found out there at Kaiser, I went in and switched immediately to this wonderful doctor that I ended up with in the urgent care. And I said, will you please be my primary care doctor? And she's been with me ever since. And she ran tons of tests. And we found out that I was really dehydrated. I had a ketone in my urine Um, She ran all these tests, and lo and behold, not all of them were available, the results right then and there, but through the next few weeks and months, we found out that I was pre-diabetic, I had asthma, and I began not to be able to even tolerate some of the foods that were there on the SIBO diet that were in the green light go column, and they were, of course, my favorites, the nuts and the eggs. And I thought, oh, no, what, you know, what am I going to do now? So I actually had to take some time off of work. And part of my healing team is my school community. I'm a teacher. So the district granted me a leave. And I began slowly to stabilize. And I realized that this was a gift of time because this wasn't going to be a quick fix. And I started educating myself. And about the same time was when your podcasts were actually, I think, coming on. This was um, the end of the summer last year. And I listened to your podcasts. I got a book called Mind Over Medicine, which um, suggested that you write your own prescription. So I wrote letters to myself. I wrote a letter to my SIBO. And I said, look, I kind of respect you guys because you're pretty formidable. I don't know how I'm going to get rid of you, but I don't think I can fight you. I'm going to have to learn to maybe respect you, and then we're going to have to work together. And uh, after a few months, I was able to go back to work. So after Christmas, I was able to go back to work, and things had stabilized. I felt more balanced. I had another SIBO test because I'd been following the herbal protocol and the diet, and my numbers were lower. And I was really excited about that. But the other thing that was concerning was that my upper GI symptoms weren't getting better. Um, I had presented in the fall with Dr. Waisaki with intense lower GI symptoms and intense upper. 
So from basically mouth to anus, A to Z, things were messed up. And I had such reflux issues that it was like a revolving door of being strangled, of coughing and choking. And add to that this asthma and the tickling in the throat and um, just terrible um, hernia that he was always trying to adjust. He called it the little monkey. And so I was trying to sleep with this wedge, uh, in, uh, you know, for my head. I had um, chest flushing and heart fluttering, choking, mucus at night, stuffy nose, and just crazy back and neck pain. My esophagus always felt like it was spasming. And I had this thing called creeper throat, where it felt like I couldn't swallow my throat. And it kept creeping up, almost like a turtleneck shirt that wouldn't stay down. So we slowly started adding in things to the protocol. And one of the things that immediately helped was magnesium citrate. So I was like, that's my new god, magnesium citrate. It helped calm me. It helped me sleep better. And it helped my my poops. So as we kind of got most of those symptoms a little more streamlined and I was able to work, Dr. Waisaki said, okay, this breath test shows that we're on the right track, but the numbers still aren't low enough. Let's go another round of protocol and let's work on the upper GI. And in the meantime, I got an endoscopy because he wanted to see what was going on with these terrible reflux issues. And oddly enough, the endoscopy showed that I only had mild inflammation of my my esophagus. And I thought it was just going to be a complete erosive esophagitis because of all the burning. So he said, okay, something else is going on here. And um, just hang tight. We're going to keep un- peeling back this, this onion layer. So in the meantime, I ended up starting these dry eyes and dry mouth symptoms again. And I'm going to drink some water right now because of my dry mouth. And when I went for my dental checkup, I went in there and I thought, well, I might have dry mouth, but this dentist is going to be so impressed because I've been on a low carb diet and I know she's going to say my teeth look great. And she was a new dentist. I'd only seen her six months before and everything was fine six months uh, prior to this. And she took one look at my mouth and she said, oh my, and I could tell something was wrong. She said, you've got a cavity, and how is your uh, oral hygiene? Are you brushing and flossing? And I said, well, yes. And she said, well, you're at a very high risk for dental caries, which was the word I'd never heard that means cavities. And she said, I want you to floss, brush uh, three times a day, but not only brush with a regular fluoride tooth- toothpaste. I want you to use this fluoride prescription toothpaste and rinse once a month with this antibiotic mouth rinse and use a um, water pick. And I'll see you back here in a couple of months because there's so much tartar on your teeth. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, what's what's happening here? So that was really depressing. And then um, the dry eyes that I had experienced when I was so dehydrated in the, in the fall, they never went away. So I went to the eye doctor and they were like, yep, you've got dry eye, but right now it's pretty mild, but we want to see you back in a few months just to, to check on this. And I also said to Dr. Waisaki, I'm going to get that IBS check, the blood test that um, Dr. Pimentel in LA is always talking about. Because I said, I want to know if I've got any of those factors that have to do with um, like a foodborne illness and food poisoning. So that test came back and it was kind of inconclusive. Dr. Waisaki said it shows that maybe that could be a factor. So that really wasn't an answer. And he said, I've got this new test from Georgia. It's called the Heidelberg test. And he said, once we get Dr. Megan Taylor, who's also been on your podcast, trained, I want to give you that test. And I said, oh, I know I'm going to have low stomach acid. And he said, well, how do you know that? I said, well, because everybody with SIBO has low stomach acid. That's going to be the answer. So I endured the Heidelberg test where you actually swallow 
a cute little orange, which is my favorite color, battery capsule on a string. And Dr. Taylor was perfect. She was such a wonderful coach because you have to put this thing in your mouth, swallow it while she hangs on to it. They taped it to, she taped it to the side of my face. And then she squirted in some bicarbonate of soda challenges. And she took these readings. And lo and behold, I had high stomach acid. So Dr. Waisaki looked at those results and said, good thing that we didn't start you on hydrochloric acid like you were begging me for <laughs> because you don't need it. And he said, let's keep um, unpacking all this. And um, he said, I also want to do a stool test. And then I said to him, while we're doing a stool test, I want to do a pee test because I had made friends on um, the SIBO Facebook group with a woman who seemed to have similar symptoms to me. So the stool test uh, showed that everything in my like digestive system was depleted. It was this low SIGA. And so I, I liken it to going out in the rain and instead of wearing a nice plastic raincoat, I was wearing like a thin piece of gauze. So the protective mucosal layer in my gut is, is gone and very absent. It's abnormally low. So that means anything can come in and, and harm me. And at the same time, the good bacteria were completely absent in my poop, the three good ones that we all need. And this reminded me of um, something I had read about the good bacteria just being obliterated. And Dr. Waisaki said, oh yeah, it's been shown in rats that rats, when they're taken away from their mothers at birth, um, they get IBS symptoms. He said, so if something is causing or has caused through your life such intense stress that the good bacteria is gone. And he said it could be a combination of um, emotional stressors and chronic illness, just having so many infections throughout your life. And I said, yeah, that's, that's me. I've basically kind of been sort of sick most of my life. Then I had this um, urine test, and that showed that, again, I was depleted. And I said to him, you know, adrenal fatigue is kind of the buzzword that you hear all the time now. Dr. Waisaki, do I have adrenal fatigue? And he said, you're beyond adrenal fatigue. You have like adrenal, adrenal depletion. And he said, but we're going to hold off on that for now because this gives us a lot of options in the future, hormonally. And he said, this also shows that you're postmenopausal. And I said, what? I said, I just had a period, you know, a few months ago at Christmas. And he said, well, according to this, you're postmenopausal. So I went to Kaiser, I had a blood test, and that showed I was postmenopausal as well. So throw in the extra layer of hormone uh, involvement and this fast track through um, menopause. And with all this dryness, then things just kind of seem to get worse. And one of the times I know that I had Skyped with you this past April, I was at my wit's end because lo and behold, I had developed a cold. And we didn't realize at the time that because I had a cold on top of everything else going on, it was like adding fuel to the fire. And long story short, if you can call it that, we discovered that I had an underlying component to my SIBO, which we're always looking for that. We're digging, digging, digging as uh, practitioners, as patients, together as a team, what is the cause or what are the many causes? And we found out that one of my many causes is an autoimmune condition. And um, I'm on this autoimmune spectrum and have these Sjogren's symptom um, conditions like the dry eye, the dry mouth. And that really was the light bulb because that explained why my motility was so slow and messed up because I am lacking the protective mucus, not only in my gut, but in my eyes, hence the dry eyes, in my nose. 
I'd been complaining of these weird nasal sores since um, the fall and my throat constantly dry. I'm going to get some more water right now because it's dry. And then the teeth. If you don't have enough saliva in your mouth, you're going to have cavities. And saliva is the beginning stage of digestion. So because my mouth is so dry, I'm lacking that wonderful protective saliva to start digesting my food. Then I'm choking and coughing unless I'm drinking water. People always used to say to me, gosh, you can't go anywhere without water. And I said, well, yeah, that's just how I am. And 30 years ago, I was developing nodules on my vocal cords, and my voice actually kind of sounded like this. And people thought I was a smoker and a whiskey drinker. And now we understand if you've got high stomach acid, which Dr. Waisaki thinks I've had my whole life, and you've got low saliva, and you're constantly dry, then you're constantly needing water, and you're needing to swallow all the time. So when you catch a cold, and you've got um, mucus because of, of being sick, but you're dry, and then you're refluxing, and you're bringing up this acid, and there's the dry, tickly throat, plus you've got a cold, it's the worst. And so in April, that's when I, I look back at my journal and I was like, I just want to die and not really, really dying, but I felt so miserable. And Dr. Waisaki was explaining that it has to do also with histamine because it seems like in the spring and in the fall, these things even before SIBO, I was kind of on this weird histamine edge, but it wasn't a traditional allergy edge. I took allergy shots in the past. They did allergy testing, but it was never really that bad. But now this um, autoimmune Sjogren's piece made sense. So once I started healing from my cold in April, May is when things really started to turn around. And I was able to take amino acids to start healing my upper gut. And along with the magnesium, um, which I considered like my God, I, I rounded out my holy trinity with glutathione and L-glutamine. And those three things have really been so crucial because I could feel the difference with the L-glutamine and the glutathione. I, I didn't start them at the same time, but... After starting each of them, <clears throat> I said to Dr. Waisaki, oh my goodness, I can feel, I feel better. I'm, I'm not refluxing the way I was. I just feel so much better. My throat isn't creeping up. And it was like I had to take time to understand that my whole life had been leading up to this defining moment and the hell that I had experienced maybe now could start to be seen as a glimmer of, of hope for the long term. So he said, what we're going to do now is um, try to kind of get you back and a little more stable. And um, he said, hmm, I just don't know what to do, what to do next. What do you think? And I said, I want another breath test. I said, it's May. I'm feeling better. And my upper gut is healing. Let's do a breath test. And he said, okay. So I did a breath test and my numbers were not good. <laughs> they weren't as bad as they were at the beginning of my journey, but they were really high and I, I just couldn't figure it out. And I said, gosh, I said, now, of course, this time when I did the prep diet, I did have diarrhea, which is weird because in August, the prep diet had stopped my diarrhea. I said, I don't know. This is really bizarre. And he said, yeah, it is. And I said, because I'm feeling so much better. And I said, but the gases are still here. And he said, yeah, they are. And, and I had very high um, hydrogen to begin with and high methane, not as bad, but I had both, which explained both the constipation and the diarrhea that um, I had been experiencing the last several months. And he said, hmm, well, he said, let's get you through the end of the school year, because that's what I had been saying. I just want to get through school. And he said, and then when school's out, we'll talk more. And in the meantime, I went to the SIBO Symposium, 
and I specifically really wanted to hear the one and a half hour talk about the elemental diet because I thought, oh my gosh, I bet I'm going to be one of those people that has to do that. Uh, so when I saw Dr. Waisaki after school was out, it was the end of June, he said, so what do you want to do? He said, here's the two things I'm thinking. He said, if we do elemental, that um, will probably help with the gas numbers. He said, or we can put the gas on the shelf for now and look at motility. He said, although your numbers are high, your overall symptoms are better. And he said, I want to kind of revisit this motility piece. Back in December, he had tried Iberogast on me, and five drops of Iberogast had sent me into a diarrhea frenzy. So we'd stayed away from that. And he said, I want to try Iberogast again. And I said, oh, no, you know, Big D is going to come back. That's my name for diarrhea. And he said, but if it does, it's okay. And I said, all right. And he said, but I have a feeling it won't. And deep down inside, I thought, well, maybe it won't either. So I said, let's let's try the motility piece because I was really afraid of elemental diet for a couple of reasons. Um, my blood sugar had been unstable throughout this journey. And I had just had a um, blood sugar panel done and it was finally back into normal range. I wasn't pre-diabetic anymore. And I thought, I don't want to mess with the elemental diet with all the sugars. And plus, one of my other um, stories from my past was constant yeast issues. And I had not had a yeast infection since I'd started on the herbal protocol. And with elemental diet, yeast can be an issue. So he said, yeah, let's, let's just try um, Iberogast. And he said, let's mix the protocol up a little bit. And that's what we kept doing. It was like we would just play rotating um, like musical chairs with the herbal protocol uh, from the fall. And I started the Iberogast and I did, you know, first night I did five drops. The next night I did six. I wasn't going to overdo it. And finally, I was like, hey, this is, this is going well. This is going okay. And then the last time I saw him, he said, all right, let's try the next piece. He said, I've always wanted to try low-dose naltrexone with you because you have an autoimmune piece and because it's a prokinetic. And for people with your kind of motility picture, we want to marry Iberogast with LDN. And I said, oh my gosh, LDN, that's a scary one because I know the side effects are um, insomnia, which I don't need more insomnia, and vivid dreams. And he said, yeah, but we'll just see. So I started the four days of one um, pill of LDN. And of course, I joined the LDN Facebook group because I said, hey, everybody, I'm starting this. And everyone said, let us know how it goes. So I did have some bizarre dreams. And um, I did feel kind of twitchy, which he said could be kind of from the motility piece. But after four nights, I did okay. Then I had to double it. And I did okay. Tonight, I'm supposed to triple it. So we'll see what happens. And with this Iberogast and this um, LDN, my poops are the most normal they have been since March of 2016. And not only are they a number four on the Bristol stool chart, and listeners, if you don't know what that is, you can Google it. And I had been for so many months, I would kind of have a four, but it would be like um, a really fuzzy, hairy four, or I'd have like a three plus or a five. But I've been pretty consistently having fours right now. And we're going to see what happens next. I still may do the elemental diet. I don't know. But what I'm able to do now is say, I can sit back. I can say, each time I see my practitioner, he will be the one that can do the worrying. I think you said to that, that to me once, Rebecca, let Dr. Waisaki do the worrying. So he will worry. He will tell me what to do. And we'll be a team together. 
So that's kind of my what I call my my front story of SIBO from the time of diagnosis until this very moment. Thank you so much for sharing that, Sharon, because that was really great for the listeners to to hear your story. And it has been a really involved story. It's not just a simple case of, oh, I got food poisoning and then I had SIBO and then I took a round of Rifaximin and then I was fine. Um, one of the things that I'd like to talk about um, particularly given how far you've come, is how have how did you manage the mental aspect or the psychological aspect? Because you've had some pretty challenging times where, you know, you've you said yourself you really, you know, felt like dying, dying because you were like, oh, I feel terrible. How did you get yourself through that phase? Well, I'm a very social person and I process through verbalizing and when I went through my divorce, I joined a uh, divorce support group. And I have found that through talking and finding like-minded people, that's what I needed to do. So I talked to my close friends as much as I possibly could. I emailed Dr. Waisaki. I started seeing a um, counselor through the program at school where we can go and we can see um, like a mental health care person. And I said, I, I need some counseling, not just counseling about, um, oh, I'm having difficulty with my marriage, but I need some mental health counseling around dealing with a chronic illness. Because just when I think I'm getting better, something else is popping up. And um, bibliotherapy, reading books, going on Facebook, but I had to be careful because as we know, with the big Facebook SIBO support group, you can get all sorts of stories. And so I looked at those and I would read a little bit and then I would turn it off and I would digest. And the good thing was it taught me some things like things that I didn't know existed back before I knew about histamine. I read about somebody having a histamine intolerance and I thought, oh my goodness, what's that? So when it ended up that I started having issues with histamine, I wasn't completely blindsided. Um, Another huge piece was drawing upon an inner strength that I developed from my family. And The mindset of my parents was amazing. Part of my backstory of SIBO is the fact that I have been dealing with intense grief since my brother died when I was 18, and I'm going to be 52 in a couple of weeks. And I come from a family where my mother, my father, and my two brothers have had cancer. In my immediate family, I am the only person who has not had cancer. And some of my family members have had more than one cancer. So when cancer is the word that you know and understand, and then this SIBO piece comes along, and then an autoimmune piece comes along, it can be really, really crazy and hard. So one thing I started to do was I wrote myself a daily mantra. And I would wake up each morning and I would say that I was grateful for another day of life and the opportunity, and this is literally what I say, to spread joy, take delight, and simply marvel at life's absurdities. Because I figured out a few years ago that my purpose in life is to spread joy. So part of life's absurdities is dealing with crazy chronic illness. And I realized that I had to be able to laugh at it and throw my hands up and say, who knows? And, and again, be kind of in awe of the mystery of illness and of SIBO. And then I drew upon the idea of humor, which was a gift of laughter from my parents. When my parents were dying of cancer, each of them had an amazing story and I was instrumental in helping each of them die at home through hospice care. And as tragic as their deaths were, it was almost like we were making up for the tragedy, the true tragedy of my brother. He was a 29-year-old doctor who died not of his cancer, but of a botched surgery 
when he had cancer. And as a surgeon himself, he knew after his exploratory surgery, surgery that something was wrong. And a week later, he was dead. And my parents never recovered from that. But they had to raise me. I was only a teenager at the time when he died. And they did that with a, amazing grace and with amazing humor. And so I drew upon that because my, my mother, when she had an incision from her colon cancer, the name of it was Tony because of the movie, The Shining, Mrs. Torrance, because the wound like kind of gurgled. I know that's totally gross, but you know, it was like this bizarre, bizarre, absurd way of dealing with things. So I started giving names to my aches and pains, like the con chronic um, back pain I had, I called old granny dry back. And I would say to my acu acupuncturist, well, that old granny dry back, she's here again. And doesn't she know she needs an invitation? And then to deal with the SIBO, I, I wrote the 12 days of SIBO for Dr. Waisaki. And it was our little in jokes. And the last day of SIBO, the, the, I, I will spare you all <laughs> my terrible voice, but the last line of the song goes, on the last day of SIBO, my ND, that stands for naturopath, my ND gave to me best wishes for improved motility. So I sang that to him. And with that, it, it really has helped me deal with it. And I talk to my parents all the time and, and I, I tell them, I can do this. And I feel like through them, I'm healing and I'm actually healing their illnesses because my father had upper GI issues and died of a mystery cancer. We think now it could have been from years of PPIs, proton pump inhibitors. He didn't know to change his diet. We did not know that. And I have those similar issue, issues for my upper GI system. Then my mother, she was a colon cancer patient survivor who developed celiac sprue, which is, of course, celiac disease and autoimmune disease. Therefore, that's in my genetic makeup. She went on to develop isemic colitis. She suffered from asthma. She had terrible allergies, horrendous osteoporosis, cracking bones, isemic colitis, and she died of pancreatic cancer. I know she had SIBO. She constantly was breaking out in hives and coughing and sneezing and allergies and all sorts of attacks. So I feel like the pancreatic cancer aspect, which is this cancer of the 21st century, and I believe that we are going to see more and more pancreatic cancer, more and more cases of SIBO along with diabetes. I have had my mother die of pancreatic cancer, a first cousin, my uncle, and my grandfather. So I feel like it is now up to me to draw upon the ancestral strength and heal my gut and stop these issues once and for all. So that's really how I've become a stronger person and dealt with it. Hey guys, do you feel completely overwhelmed when it comes to figuring out what you can eat that's suitable for a SIBO diet? I know that I felt so overwhelmed at the start of my SIBO journey. And let's be honest, eating for SIBO can be challenging. It can downright suck at points. You've already got so much going on. You've got your treatment. You're trying to remember to take all your medications and your supplements. And not to mention all of the daily symptoms that you have to experience. The pain, the bloating, the constipation or diarrhea or both and the brain fog and exhaustion. The list just goes on. Having someone else take that hassle away from you for planning your food can make your day just that little bit easier. And this is where I've come to your rescue. I've developed SIBO meal plans just for you. They take all of the stress away from planning your SIBO daily food intake. They're based on the SIBO biphasic diet by Dr. Narala Jacoby, and each meal plan is just for the specific phase it relates to. So you may be on phase one restricted, 
or phase one semi-restricted or phase two reduce and repair. And there is a meal plan just for you. We've got 14 days of SIBO friendly meals and recipes included. There's weekly shopping lists, there's handy hints and tips to make cooking easier and every recipe is 100% gluten free. The recipes are low grain, we only use a little bit of rice or quinoa in the recipes depending on what phase you're following, of course. All the recipes are low carbohydrate, very low dairy, low sugar, and there are low FODMAP options included. The great news is that you can download it instantly and you can get cooking today. If you'd like to know more about the SIBO meal plans, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash SIBO hyphen meal hyphen plans or head to the show notes from today's episode and just click on the link there. I hope you enjoy the meal plans, guys. I know it's going to save you so much time, energy and effort and help you be compliant to your SIBO diet as you go through your treatment. Now let's get back to the show. I absolutely love the way that you have drawn humour into the situation when you could have really easily just kind of gone into very depressive states and, you know, raged against the world and shouted, you know, it's not fair, why me? And I think the fact that you you have been able to utilise humour, um, even in the darkest days, is what has been a really great support for you to to be able to put one foot in front of the other and get through. Um, I love the 12 days of Christmas of, of SIBO and <laughs> I think that's really great. Um, and, you know, I think that, that we – Sometimes it's very difficult for us to find the positives or the humour in our situations, but that can be a really big support for us just to pick ourselves up and and keep going. And I know that myself, when I went through my SIBO journey, which is still ongoing, I wouldn't say that I'm over it. I'm just moving into a different layer of the onion, like you talked about peeling back the layers. And I developed the five key pillars to health, uh, and that is um, awareness, nutrition, movement, mindset, and lifestyle. And you know, you've really um, done a lot around that mindset piece, um, using humour to uh, support your journey. Um, and you've talked quite a bit about the nutrition piece and the awareness piece. You're very well educated on this condition, and and a lot of other kind of a lot of um, other conditions that you also experience. Um, are you happy to talk about the five key pillars, Sharon, and and um, and what that means to you and, and how you've been able to, I guess, adopt um, the philosophy of the five key pillars into your life? Oh, I'd love to. And in fact, that was part of my bibliotherapy when I discovered your fantastic uh, web resources back in the fall, I downloaded and printed out those five key pillars and put them in a notebook along with my SIBO recipes. And um, starting with awareness, when when you're chronically ill and have been most of your life, it's really kind of hard, I think, to be aware of how you're feeling because it's normal. And it really wasn't until I was extremely unwell that I realized how years of neglect had built up. I really didn't know that I had this migrating motor complex that needed a break. And so now I'm constantly aware of what I do now compared to what I did in the past. In the past, I was just a radical snacker. I always thought, well, we're supposed to eat all the time to keep the blood sugar up and never want to go hungry. And I never gave my poor migrating motor complex, complex, the chance to work properly. And so I think now I'm so much more aware of my body and I can do this pre SIBO, post SIBO diagnosis flip flop. And that's really comforting because I can physically see the difference in, um, my, my body and my mind. And with that awareness, then I can move on into the other areas and nutrition. I always thought I was super healthy and 
in my mind, super healthy pretty much meant I have oatmeal for breakfast and I would get into these ruts where I would just have oatmeal for breakfast. Lunch was carrots and celery and cottage cheese usually and um, lots of hummus, lots of wheat crackers and uh, a lot of string cheese, fruit throughout the day, constantly snacking because I was always hungry. I don't think I was ever getting enough protein. And then dinner. Oh, no. When I was married, my husband was the cook. And then we often went out to eat a lot. Dinner was the worst. I had grown up with my mom cooking. And then when I was on my own, I was like a pork and beans girl. Just open a can of pork and beans. Get a Weight Watchers frozen dinner. Um, go out and get uh, something healthy, get a bean burrito. So I was eating all of these highly fermentable foods and thinking I was was super healthy. And it wasn't like I was eating cheeseburgers and um, pork rinds every night, but it wasn't the right kind of health for me. So now I just bask in the glory of nutrition. I've learned so much because before I accepted everything. I was eating everything from cheese whiz to brie. I loved, you know, high quality, low quality, give it all to me, I'll take it. So now I'm more discerning. And I say, hmm, is this going to be the best thing for me? Is this the best amount for me? What is going to be the most nutritious? And I had no idea that as a foodlum, yes, I'm a foodlum. I'm the person who loves the Hobbit, not because of the adventures, but because the hobbits eat a second breakfast. I mean, that's really what I took away from that book was, whoa, second breakfast, that's me. And I now, for breakfast, I don't get stuck in a rut. I actually have things and listeners, you might think, oh no, she's not really serious and she doesn't really like this. But because I went to Christy Regan, who you've also had on the podcast, and is a nutritionist who um, works out of eight hearts part-time, she got me looking at new things like liver, chicken liver. And I will fry up chicken liver with a little thyme and lemon juice and Swiss chard, and I love it. I mean, I seriously love it. If you had told me five years ago I would be eating that for breakfast and be happy, I would have said, you're absolutely bonkers and crazy. And little things like heating up fruit and making a warm fruit compote. And if you're able to tolerate um, a little bit of cream of rice, putting that on your cream of rice, but making sure that you've got some protein and making sure that the meal is balanced. Um, and Dr. Waisaki with my uh, stomach acid and such, he likes me to have 60% of my meal be... Um, fruits, vegetables, starches, and then the rest um, be uh, fats and, and proteins. And he's really pushing the fat because part of the amazing thing is on this SIBO diet, my triglycerides are down to 37. He said, why, Sharon, those triglycerides are better than Gandhi's. <laughs> and I thought, how does he know what Gandhi's triglycerides were? <laughs> But of course, Gandhi um, was eating a, a lot of veggies, so maybe mine are even lower because of the fats and the animal proteins. I mean, mentally, I'd love to be a vegetarian, but right now, I, I can't. I, I need the, the animal protein. Um, sorry, all you vegan and veggies out there, and I know there's a way to deal with SIBO if you are vegan or veggie, but um, I am getting so much nutrition and feeling so satisfied, it's, it's, it's just amazing. And after I have my nutritious meals, movement has always been an issue for me. As a kid, I was never active enough. And as a young adult, when I was on Weight Watchers, I, I realized that I needed to move more. And of course, back in the 80s, Weight Watchers was all about high carbs. So we've learned that that's not always the best route to go, especially when you end up being a SIBO or like me. So for movement, which is the third key pillar, I like to do some kind of M and M every day. And that's my personal, not candy, M&Ms is an American candy, but it's movement and meditation. And even if it's just a walk 
to the school across the street and back. That's movement. And I try to incorporate incorporate meditation as well. And I might combine them. I might put my earphones in and listen to a meditation app. They have many meditation apps. So even if it's three minutes, I can breathe and walk across the street and come back. And if there's more time in my day, it's summer here right now in Portland. And I love to go out in the back garden and spread out a towel. I'm going to take another sip of water here. And lie down on my towel and stretch. And then I can look up at the beautiful um, evergreen trees that are in my backyard. And nature, they've done studies that people are seeming to be healthier and happier during summer because they're able to get out more in nature. And I guess the studies have even shown that a walk in nature is better than a walk in the city. Somehow people are healthier and happier. Don't ask me how, but it's out there on the internet. And so I try to go out living in Portland. It's, it's gorgeous here. And we can go on beautiful trails here. I like to hike with my friends. And um, I see a trainer at the gym. She's part of my healing team. I um, have taken yoga and bar three classes. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to see a friend who's a Qigong instructor because my acupuncturist said I think that might help your um, aches and pains. And one of my favorites is just dancing. I am not afraid to get up and dance in front of people. I'm on many wedding videos of friends' weddings, dancing to myself. I dance here at home in my living room, and I love to go out and dance and and see concerts and uh, jazz shows. So I will get up and dance if the music moves me. And so movement is huge because we need to balance our motility. And with my body, I know movement helps things uh, move through. Um, mindset, we did talk a lot about. That's the fourth pillar. And another interesting piece with mindset is that my genetic testing, which I did through 23andMe, and then we ran it through a Prometheus and a genetic genie um, filter. So Dr. Waisaki could look at my genetic profile and he said, wow, you actually have pretty good genes. Your genes are 95% better than most of my patients, but where you really have some terrible genes, he didn't say they sucked, but it was basically like they really suck in the neurotransmitter department. So I have to work really hard in that area, and that's the area um, that has to do with like the histamines, and it also has to do with anxiety and depression, and those things run in my family. So using those uh, tools that I talked about earlier really helped me. And I now know it's a physical component. It's physically there in my genetic makeup. And when spring and summer hit and the histamines are in the air, if I get sick, somehow I, I don't know how, but, but I've read on the internet and Dr. Waisaki has told me that the gases and um, the reflux and the histamine, it's all kind of related. So I can get in a real big tizzy. But one more thing about mindset that helped when all this came crashing down, I said to him, Dr. Waisaki, I need more help with the mindset piece and give me a new book to read. And because of his background in therapy and getting a bachelor's in theology, which he has, and he's been a counselor and really knows how to deal with the heart and soul of patients, he recommended a book called Radical Acceptance by Tara Brock. And that book, more than any other book, has changed my mindset. And the big lesson from that book is, this sucks, but I can handle it. So now when something goes wrong, whether it's uh, forgetting to put the chicken away that I've left out on the counter. And then I wake up the next morning and I go, gosh, darn it. All that organic chicken. I worked so hard. And I, one night I was taking out one chicken to put in another and I saved one and then the other one got ruined. So I just try to take a deep breath and say, this sucks, but I can handle it. 
And then knowing that I can handle it because I have enough supports within me and without me, that's really seeing me through. And the fifth and final pillar is lifestyle. And for me, lifestyle, the big lesson I've learned is balance. I wasn't balanced before. I would rush, kind of as my mother used to say, you're just rushing headlong into the night and you're, you're screaming and yelling or you're putting all your energy into one area. And I used to do that socially. I would stay out late and I would party with my friends and I would call my friends and I would uh, wake up early and try to plan the lessons and then go to work and then try to work out and try to see a concert and then hang out with my boyfriend. And it's just, oh my goodness, I was constantly exhausted, but I really didn't know. I didn't really know how exhausted I was making myself um, until everything kind of crashed. And now I can look back and say, oh yeah, I was doing too much. And then like you, Rebecca, you've talked about you were either lying on the couch or the next minute you were training for a triathlon. I would also go through periods of um, intense kind of lethargy. And I remember one summer, I felt like most of the summer was just sort of spent watching TV and lying on the sofa. So it was really hard for me to get balanced. And I really feel that deep breathing and meditation has helped. And that helps me stay balanced, whether I'm facing a nutritional challenge or an emotional challenge. Now I'm able to go in and I've developed inner reserves, which I never had before. I was constantly reaching out, you know, relying on my family or relying on, um, uh, a, a guy I was dating or um, friends or something. Now I'm much calmer and it, more at peace. I can take care of myself. I look forward to my quiet time alone and I don't have to be going out with friends all the time. I don't have to be constantly planning the next concert or the next night out. And now this is amazing that I'm actually saying this. I can be just as happy taking a leisurely bath with my bath salts and using my little aromatherapy machine and listening to your podcast. You know that that's one joy of mine now is listening to the podcast. Gee, I guess one night I'll be listening to myself in the bath. That's really kind of trippy. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, right there, listening to the podcast in the dark with the little lights flashing that I've got on my cool aromatherapy machine, that's really relaxing. And I can meditate and I can breathe deep. And then the next night, maybe I'll go out dancing and go to a jazz club. They're both good. In the past, only the jazz club was good. And I didn't want to be home alone because that wasn't exciting. But now it is because that's part of being balanced and living a healthy lifestyle. And one more thing I just wanted to say about that was in episode 40 of The Healthy Gut, Dr. Waisaki said, there's no question chronic disease changes you. The only question is how. So that to me ties together the five key pillars. Thank you, Sharon. That was a uh, really lovely um, in your demonstration of how you apply those pillars. Another question I have for you is, and this is what I talk about a lot, is around finding a dream team of people that can help you for the various aspects. Now, you've re you really have touched on it quite a lot with the gorgeous J Dr. Jason Wysocki. Um, are you happy to share some of the other people that you have as part of your dream team and what they're there to do to help you with? Oh, yeah. Like I said, for me, it's all about people and it's all about connections. And I wish all of these people could be like on an Olympic podium right now. And I would be giving them all gold medals because Team Treadgold is amazing. And not only am I super lucky, I mean, really, Rebecca, how lucky am I to live near Portland, Oregon? Who knew that I lived near SIBO Central. I mean, I'm 30 minutes away on the highway 
from amazing SIBO docs. So in addition to my wonderful um, Dr. Waisaki, I have uh, other people at Eight Hearts. I have um, Xander, who is my acupuncturist. I have Christy, the nutritionist. I have um, Megan Taylor, um, who gave me my Heidelberg test. I have Dr. Deborah Rice, who I just saw for the first time at Eight Hearts because, yes, guess what? I've got a yeast infection. But the amazing thing is we're trying new things. We think it's tied in a lot to my hormones. And um, I'm on a new naturopathic path for treating yeast infections, which is actually kind of exciting. So in addition to the Eight Hearts team, I have the people at Kaiser. So I have become a manager and I tag team my naturopathic world at Eight Hearts and my um, medical docs there at Kaiser Permanente. So not only do I have the Kaiser nutritionist who told me about SIBO and told me to go to the naturopathic college, I have my wonderful primary care physician at Kaiser. I have a pulmonologist, a rheumatologist, an endocrinologist, a gastroenterologist, a physical therapy team because I've had all these aches and pains. I have a TMJ dentist, and that's that temporomandibular joint disease. I have to wear a mouth guard at night because of all the teeth grinding I have. Um, I even saw a medical astrologer who said amazing things without even knowing me, but just looked at my chart. And she said, your SIBO is just a mosquito. <laughs> she said, do you have so many other things going on underneath? <clears throat> so she's part of my team, the trainer at the gym, um, my school district, all my coworkers at the Beaverton School District, and the people in human resources who have listened to my story and have given me time off to see the doctor. I have two amazing massage therapists. Um, I have an amazing chiropractor. I have the Facebook groups. I have um, all my friends and family. And a special kind of shout out to my friend. She's been my best friend since kindergarten. Her mother her mother walked me and talked to me through roasting the perfect chicken back in the fall when I was like, wait a minute, I have to do all this cooking for myself? I'm not a cook. So because my mother is no longer with us and I wanted that motherly figure, I'm having my friend's mother, who I've known since 1970, be kind of like a mother figure through the cooking with me. And then I have another friend who's a chef up in Seattle, and I will call her and troubleshoot things like <laughs> not being a very good cook. I accidentally started eating raw shrimp once because I, I was going to cook them, but then I didn't realize, oh, wait a minute, wait, these have to be cooked. And I started to eat the raw shrimp, and I called her and I said, oh my gosh, I've just eaten a raw shrimp. What do I do? They're supposed to be cooked, right? Because they're not pink. She said, calm down, relax. And she told me to drink like lemon juice and, and um, <laughs> salt and sugar. And I was fine. And then when I told Dr. Waisaki, I said, I'm too embarrassed to tell you. I, I ate a raw shrimp without cooking it. And he said, well, you were probably protected by the herbal protocol. And I said, yeah, I was. So she's part of my team. And of course... The um, SIBO coaching program that I'm involved with is part of my team. And now I'm actually co-organizing digestive health meetups here in Portland. Um, when I went to the SIBO symposium and I met Dr. Melanie Keller, I said to her, how can you still be in charge of a meetup group in Portland when you're down in LA now? And she said, well, I've got Carrie Lynn helping me out. And why don't I introduce you to her? Because um, it sounds like you're interested in being involved in the meetup. And I said, I am. That's really important for me is to be with like-minded people. So 
we just had a meetup a couple of weeks ago, and it was some Eight Hearts patients and I, and a Chinese herbalist, and it was amazing. We had tea, and we talked all about the journey that we're all on, whether we're a patient or a practitioner. So that's my dream team. (laughs) <laughs> and what a dream team it is. I'm, I'm sitting here listening to you talk about the, you know, the vast array of people that you have got. And I'm thinking there's probably some people listening to this podcast going, oh my gosh, that's overwhelming. Do I need to have a dream team that diverse? Like, do you think we need to have as many people in our dream team as, as you have? Or, or do you think that, um, you know, even if we've just got one or two, that that can still be supportive? I think it depends on the person. It depends on what you need and want. I'm super lucky, but I'm a people person. This is where I draw my strength from is connecting and working with people. And as a school teacher, kids and people are the vibrant vitality that I thrive off of. I'm an extrovert. Some people might just need a practitioner and that's it. And some people maybe don't need all these other things that might be too much for them and indeed overwhelming. And of course, the pendulum can swing, just like the constipation to the diarrhea, the anxiety to the depression, you know, the highs, the lows. Um, I tend to be kind of an extreme person. And sometimes I even have to crawl under the covers and go into my shell and, and regenerate and rejuvenate. And that's something I'm learning to do. Um, so definitely it's, it's just like there's not one diet or protocol for everybody. There's not a dream team template that will fit everyone. You have to know yourself enough to create your own team. Definitely. And, uh, I think for those of us extroverts, cause I am, you know, I don't know that there is any remote molecule of me that's introvert. I'm 100% extrovert. And I've done what you've done, Sharon. I've got a really broad dream team of people that I that I um, call upon for support because I too get my energy from others. Um, my partner, um, so my partner is more naturally introverted. My sister is a complete introvert and her girlfriend is is quite introverted as well. We were having dinner on the weekend and they were teasing me and they were saying that I was an energy vampire, that I sucked the energy out of everybody else. And I said, I only suck the energy out of you introverts. Us extroverts find it all very recharging. (laughs) But I think you're right. Finding the dream team that really does work well for you is what's important. And, And neither you or I could tell people you must have Uh, all of these things in place um, because it may not work for others. I'd like to touch a little bit on, we'll just finish out on um, the SIBO coaching program. It is a program that I developed really in response to the number of inquiries that I had coming through from people looking for that emotional and lifestyle support. And the program is based on the five key pillars but I'd love for you Sharon to share your experience with it and and why that has been a support and part of your dream team oh definitely well being the extrovert that I am um I said to uh my boyfriend who's also an extrovert and has been super helpful even suggesting let's make recipes together from the SIBO cookbook I mean that's super supportive I said to him you know, I've got such an amazing dream team. Do I do I really need this coaching program? And I thought to myself, okay, Sharon, where are you right now? You're in this place where you're kind of on this edge. Your SIBO is getting under control, but you're not really sure about this autoimmune piece and summer's coming. Hmm. I just, I feel like I want to try this out. And what I loved was you came to to Portland. And so it it, it all kind of, because I'm such a people person, it was like when you were in Portland with Dr. Waisaki, and I've said this before, it was like seeing the Beatles and the Stones on the same ticket or Duke Ellington and Ella Fitzgerald. I I had admired your story and I thought, I want to be in this coaching program and I want to get more mentorship, and I want to see what it's like 
just to try this. And what I loved was you put out these um, surveys and you asked us questions and what we would like to see. And I really admire the fact that we can leave the program if and when we need to, and we can always go back. Because being a chronic illness for so many of us, we might have periods where we come and go and we don't have unlimited funds. And what's wonderful is I enjoy the little SIBO family. It's great having the big SIBO family in the um, support group, the, the big general Facebook group. But this is my little SIBO family. And I mean, I've made friends on there that are in Australia. And I've learned all these cute little Australian phrases. And it's winter there now. And here it's summer. And I can go online and see what people are eating to stay cozy. And I feel like I, it's my SIBO family because the regular friends and family and even the docs, I think they've heard enough. And so I can go on the Facebook group and I can have a variety of my needs met, like through the webinars, through the um, live little videos that you do, like you did one today, you had just seen your doctor and you were reporting to us. So you're relating to us as a coach and as a SIBO patient, even though you're farther along than so many of us. And it's, for me, like this connection, and it's all about connection. So it makes me feel special. That's wonderful. And that's one of the reasons why I set up the program is is that we can feel so isolated and alone with this condition quite often. Um, we don't know anybody else with SIBO. Uh, well, we do, but they don't know that they've got SIBO and nor are they talking about it. So generally our connections are with people online and quite often it's the Facebook group, the big Facebook group where you first start to meet people. And I, I, I guess because I'm such a social person, I wanted to bridge the gap between feeling alone and isolated and feeling like I was part of something. And I love our community. Um, I love the fact that people do come in and go as they need to. Um, but we're, we're like a little family and uh, we know that we'll always be there for each other, which is, you know, what I really enjoy. <laughs> if um, we're you know, we know you're talking to people in this podcast because, you know, thousands of people listen uh, to every episode of the podcasts. If you've got any tips or advice that you could share with someone, perhaps someone that's at the early part of their journey, or they may even be, um, you know, have been dealing with this for some time and they're just sick of it, they're over it. What, what would be some words of wisdom that you would like to share with um, the people listening today? Definitely uh, tips are super important. If you're just starting out on your SIBO journey, welcome to the family. Be open to it taking longer than you anticipate and be ready to learn a lot about yourself because this isn't just a health journey. As Dr. Wysocki says, it's a mind, body, spirit journey. And if you're a chronic SIBOer, well, then you've got You've got guts, literally and figuratively, because think about it. You, me, all the chronic SIBOers out there have likely been living with this for years and years. How strong are we that we have been able to continue our life, not maybe even knowing we have an underlying chronic illness? And now that we know it, we've got to... Uh, Dig in and, and, and build upon that strength that we've been having all these years and fight on and try to figure out what's caused it and what we can do to heal. Even if we can never fully be cured 100%, we can begin the healing process, and that takes a lot of strength. So we're tough people. So all you chronic seawowers out there, and I know some of you have been at it even longer than I have, and so I admire your perseverance. And... I really think it's important to find a practitioner that you trust. And once you do, trust what they say, even if it's not aligned to what you just read on the internet or what you think you need next. Because there were many times I'd go to Dr. Waisaki and I'd say, well, what about da 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 I read a da 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 And he said, okay, that's good, but not for you. Or we might deal with that later. And 
it's really important because things like um, the liposomal vitamin C, which he wanted me to start a few months ago, I started it and I was too nauseous. And I said, I can't take this. And I was all upset. This vitamin C, it's making me nauseous and no, 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 no. But a couple months ago when I had a cold, my boyfriend said, well, can't you take some vitamin C? And I was like, no, I can't. I, uh. And then I said, wait a minute. That's been about three months. I bet I can take that vitamin C now. And lo and behold, I could. And my body accepted it. And so things that we think at one point are a catastrophe might end up later down the line being a salvation and working out. So just kind of lay back and go with the flow. Trust your body. I think our bodies want to heal. Celebrate the positives. So instead of worrying about my upcoming liver scan because I've got these cysts in my liver, I'm looking at my beautiful, healthy nails. My nails on my fingers are healthier now than they've been in probably 20 years because my gut is healing. And um, also, I think it's important, along with humor, is to have as much fun as you can with this. I bought cute ice packs with kitties on them to to take my um, meds, all my meds that are on ice with me when I travel. Um, I take my Iberogast shots in a vintage uh, shot glass that my parents had, you know, back in the 60s when everybody was drinking cocktails all the time. And um, I put heart-shaped Post-its on the fridge with my list of AM and PM meds because I find early in the morning when I'm waking up and late at night, I just need a list. It's like, oh, what do I need to take now? And I take four or five things when I wake up and go to sleep. So I made a cute little post-it board on the fridge. Um, the food and mood diary that you have in your program, I've been keeping one of those since last August, but I do it in a journal. And I get journals that have cute sayings and positive affirmations like the one about wait for the storm to pass, but learn to dance in the rain. So living with SIBO is dancing in the rain. And um, that's really been helpful for me. Um, another trick is keeping those really therapeutic food items that you know you do well with on hand at all times by freezing them. Because if you're beginning to experiment with new things like Parmesan cheese or... Um, avocado, you can take out that frozen chicken. And then if the time is right, you can add those little things when you're doing a food challenge. But if you're having a flare, then you can reach into that fridge and say, there's my good old trusty carrot, zucchini and chicken. Um, so I feel like more than ever, the freezer is a good insurance policy. I never knew how to use a freezer before I knew how to cook. Um, Another idea is to have a really fun favorite party item that you can wow your friends with. And I like coconut chips. I get the coconut flakes and I put them in the oven for about um, five minutes and toast them with sesame oil, salt, and ginger. I learned that from another person on my dream team I forgot to mention. And through Christy Regan, I found this amazing woman who can come to the house and cook SIBO meals and put them in my freezer. And she is fantastic. And Julie will come um, to the house and she will make these SIBO chips. And now I know how to make them and she'll stock my fridge with things. So finding out those things where you're maybe weakest. For me, cooking was a weakness. I, I had to develop my cooking muscle. Um, and then I can take those things to the parties. And people love those coconut chips. They're really, really into them. And setting a pretty table, going out in the back uh, yard, putting a pretty flower tablecloth, cutting a pretty flower from the garden, going out buying roses, those kinds of things. I do that for myself now. I stop and I literally smell the roses. And finally, one thing I really feel is important that helped me was writing my SIBO resume. I took a stack of index cards and I ended up with 47 index cards ranging from everything that I could think of that led to my SIBO diagnosis. The first one was being bottle fed. I wasn't breastfed. 
You know, I was overfed as a child. I had constant colds, ear infections. I had a high carb diet. I had mono when I was 18, terrible menstrual cramps. I didn't exercise a lot, blocked eustachian tubes, um, chronic constipation, traveler's constipation, stinky gas. I mean, it was always, where can I go to pass gas and, you know, fart in private? And, you know, these things people might laugh at, but they're also horrendous things that that keep you from feeling relaxed. Um, so that really helped because now I have a stack of cards. That's my SIBO resume. I can see why I have what I have. And um, it was just amazing to find so many things right up before my diagnosis, all these itises. I ended up with tendonitis, labyrinthitis, folliculitis, all this itching and hemorrhoids. And one thing I want to say that is really now we feel changing my path is structural integration. Dr. Waisaki feels that I have been malabsorbing my nutrients for so many years that it has led to my body, similar to your adhesions, Rebecca, the tight fascia in my legs, my neck, my lower back, my arms, it's so tight that I've been in chronic pain and it's part of the motility piece. I've had three structural integration sessions with him. I'd had some in the past from my amazing massage therapist. She also does structural integration and that I think got me primed. But now Dr. Waisaki does this body work and it's actually making my fascia and the tendons and the connective tissue move. So not only is my motility in my gut moving, but in my body where I'm able to stand grounded on my own two feet. And this is actually helping my digestive system. It's, it's amazing. And that really gets to the bigger picture. So for listeners, the, what's your big picture? For me, it's a lifetime of being stuck and stuffing myself, whether it's overeating as a foodlum, whether it's having too many items in the house. Both my parents had too much stuff in that house. And when they died, I took all their stuff and put it into storage units. I had two 20 by 10 storage units of their things, my grandparents' things, and my brother's things. This summer, after four years of going through storage, I finally have shut down the second and final storage unit. And so that stuffedness and that um, just being stuck, whether it's in my gut, in my body, in my mind, in my storage, is now flowing. And I'm doing what you said in episode 41 when you were talking to the wonderful Angela who uh, was the health coach, I believe you said, you need to make room for your healing and recovery. So I'm doing that in my house and in my mind and my body and my gut. I'm making room for my healing. And I'm so happy to hear it. And it's one of the reasons why I reached out to you and asked you to come on the show today so that you could share your own personal journey with others, give others hope who are um, at various stages of their journey and share some of the wisdom that you yourself have um, developed through this very interesting experience. Sharon, if people would like to connect with you, um, what's the best way for them to get in touch? Yes, I have an email that I am reserving, especially reserving for gut issues. And that would be gutactivist at gmail.com. That's lowercase, all one word, G-U-T-A-C-T-I-V-I-S-T at gmail.com because I feel my future is going to be with some kind of gut activism. As a school teacher, we've got kids coming up in our future. They deserve a happy and healthy future. And I'm interested in helping to pave the way for that um, because we've got health care issues in this country and we have crazy diets that people are following and not living nutritiously. So I see the future as being a gut activist um, as very important. 
and um, it's wonderful to have an educator that wants to do something around um, helping educate others. So, Sharon, thank you so much for sharing your story on the Healthy Gut podcast today. Thank you, Rebecca. It's been an utter pleasure. I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Sharon Treadgold. If you would like to get access to the show notes from today's episode, just head to the healthy gut forward slash Sharon. Nice and easy to remember. And if you found this episode helpful and you think other CBOAs out there might like to hear about the personal journey of one woman's experience with SIBO, please make sure you share this with them. I know that it's really useful when we hear about others that are going through a similar experience to ourselves because we no longer feel so alone and isolated. And don't forget to leave a rating and review in iTunes or the app you use to listen to this podcast. And pick one thing that you found really useful about the show and share that with other listeners so they can see whether this is the right type of podcast for them to listen to where they're on the search for information about gut health. And come and say hi to us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest and Google+. We absolutely love seeing you there. Just look for us under The Healthy Gut. On next week's show, we're joined by Dr. Michael Traub, who talks to us about skin conditions and the correlation between SIBO and disordered digestion and what's happening on our skin. As someone who experienced a lot of pain and suffering with terrible skin afflictions over the years, this is a subject that's very close to my heart and I really look forward to bringing it to you next week. See you then. You've been listening to the Healthy Gut Podcast with your host, Rebecca Coombs. To learn more about the Healthy Gut or our podcast, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. And as we are fully funding this podcast, if you would like to help support the continuation of this podcast so that we can continue to bring you future episodes, all you need to do is make a contribution at thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. We would like to thank Belinda Coombs for the production, editing and original music score of this podcast. To hear more of Belinda's music, head to soundcloud.com forward slash Belinda Coombs. The Healthy Gut Podcast is a production of The Healthy Gut. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.